Before starting my presentation, I would like to give you my definition of what the term megaliths means to me. In this way, we will start on a good basis of understanding. For me, megaliths are part of prehistoric architectures. These architectures were built by communities that chose to use stone as a material to bury their dead or to commemorate an event or for collective space. The term megalith implies the notion of large stone, yet you will agree with me that many megalithic uh, tombs in Europe were built with small stones and hearths, as it is the case for the Cairn of Barnonez and the Tumulus Saint-Michel in Karnak in Brittany. It turns out that in the Middle East, we have the same diversity of materials. Some monuments are built with very large slabs of several tones, other are assemblies of dry stone walls. Researchers working on the funerary architectures of the Middle East have been slow to consider these architectures as megalithic architectures. You will be agree with me that the term megalith doesn't reflect the reality of the field, but it is the only one today that reveals the common intention between all these architectures, the use of the stone to realize a monument above the ground, respecting common codes as to transmit a message. But before we say more, let's move on the next slide. In the Middle East, there is not one kind of megalithic monument, but several kinds of megalithic monuments. If we take stock on the discoveries made in Arabia or in the Levant, from one valley to another, there are differences in typology. The examples of megalithic tombs that I show you on this slide are found all over the Middle East. Among of the 10 of so form recorded, such as flat tumuli, cyst, oval tomb, or wool tombs, two types of tombs stand out and form two almost homogeneous sets. These are the tower tombs, like here, and the dolmens, here you have an example, in Syria and here in Yemen. What is particularly interesting for the western part of Arabia, as well as for the Levant, these burial chambers accommodate quite a few individuals from 2 to 20 minimum, a maximum. In these two categories, on the top of the slide, uh, you have three pictures of dolmen, and on the lower part of the slide, three pictures of two tombs. Very roughly, one could describe the dolmen with rectangular chambers and a slab cover and the tower tombs with circular chambers and a cobalt cover. On a case-by-case -case basis, uh, from one necropolis to another, there are, of course, diversity like door, crown, double chamber. But if we look the big picture in the Middle East, there is two distinct groups of funerary traditions, dolmen and tower tomb. The recent work carried out in Menges in Akkar in Lebanon come to disturb this beautiful assumption. As I said before, as soon as you focus on a region, you discover local particularities. Uh, here is a cross section of a monument in Menges. What is remarkable is that the builders uh, prepared the ground. Uh, we are on a hill, uh, and to stabilize the architecture, the builder of the tomb have built a terrace here. With a blocking wall on the north side, they created a stable environment with small stones to accommodate the autostat of the chamber, the crown wall, and the enclosure. As you can see on the, top of, on the picture, the corridor has not preserved uh, its roofing element here are missing. But the room has uh, several slabs at the top, which form the first part of the corbelled roof. Uh, it's hard to see, but here you have the part of the corbel. You can find uh, in uh, the cross section here, uh, this one. Um, 
The east-west section shows the order in which all the elements of the tomb uh, were placed, the paving, um, the orthostat, the crown, and the corbelled vault. Take time to observe the corbel in its position. Uh, this helps to understand how they implemented this vault with just the pressure of the crown blocks. With my colleague, Dr. Florian Cousseau, we discussed the shape of the vault at length. As Florian is a researcher who works mainly in Brittany, his proposal was a dome, a bit like the cairns found in, the, in this region. For my part, I proposed a flat roof uh, since I was strongly uh, influenced by my work in Arabia. We finally opted to the flat floor, a uh, flat roof. To the question, do we have dolmen or tower tombs in Menges? It is clear that in Menges, in the North Lebanon, some of the monuments have a hybrid form between a dolmen and a tower tomb. First, the corbelled roof from the tower tombs aspect, the corridor covered by a slab uh, typical of dolmens, and the enclosure to its, uh, to its characteristics uh, that is characteristic of both dolmens and tower tombs. So when and where are the megaliths in the Middle East? I felt the need to put a timeline because sometimes it is quite confusing to know when megalithic monuments appear in the Middle East. So since the ninth millennium BC, we know that communities built community buildings with megalithic pillars. In the North Levant, like Goblekli Tepe, or erected at the seaside in Atlit, or in the 7th millennium BC, uh, built large rectangles of dry stone walls, the famous Mustatil that the Araxa project described in Saudi Arabia, or the recent discoveries of Gazel Trap Sanctuary with many statues made by Wael uh, Abu Azize and his colleague Mohamed Taroune. I had a slide uh, in the slide a picture from the famous Barnanez, uh, the, the cairn in Barnanez in France. It's a huge cairn with 11 dolmens to give you an idea of his uh, typology and chronology. Then from the 6th millennium uh, to the 5th millennium BC, communities in the Middle East pay particular attention to stone, having the technical means to handle stones, weighing several tons in collective projects like standing stones, platform, even some funerary cairns. But in the 4th millennium BC, uh, a real revolution took place in these communities. The dead were buried in ostentatious stone architectures. From burial in the ground or in jar or in ossuaries, we move in a very short time to burials above ground, visible to the community or its neighbors. The risk of occupation of the necropolises are not always the same, but the common point is the megalithic phenomenon which starts around the 9th millennium BC with collective and commemorative monuments, move on in the 4th millennium BC to funerary architectures. If at the beginning the megalithism was linked to a collective project, it seems at the end of the 5th, 4th millennium BC, this prehistoric stone architecture slides toward a more individual project on a family scale. This aspect marks a profound change in human behavior, which translates into the multiplication of architectures. There are tens of thousands of tombs that punctuate the landscape of the Middle East. Now, just a few words about the pictures at the left part of slide. As uh, Susanna said, uh, I worked in uh, Indonesia, and there the megalithism is a, um, a practice alive. Um, and um, uh, I have made some observation on how they build dolmen, how are the rituals and the behavior in the recent megalithic communities. 
this experience was very useful for me to understand the mechanism related to the genesis of uh, these architectures, but I will tell you more uh, about this uh, a few, in a few slides. During the 5th millennium BC, uh, Middle East landscapes were strongly impacted by their inhabiting uh, communities, the same that built the prehistoric architectures called megaliths. There are also enclosures, habitat structures, traps called kites, walls, sanctuaries, raised stones, and many statues. Whether in the valley uh, with oasis, in the mountains, or in desert areas, no space is devoid of human markers. Without going into the details of the local particularities, the spread of the dolmens and tower tombs stand out and form two almost homogeneous groups. These are the dolmens, uh, the dolmens um, so you can see uh, in the green uh, circle or square, uh, they are concentrated from the Orunt in central Syria to the south of the Dead Sea in Jordan, and from the Jordan Plateau in Israel to the syro jordanian Ara Desert. And the tower tombs with the blue circles and square uh, found from the Sinai to Oman and from south of Syria uh, to Yemen. On the map, the size of the circles gives you an indication of the number of monuments per necropolis. Recent works from the Australian team confirmed that the distribution of the tombs is largely uh, underestimated from Central Arabia. But overall, there are several tens of thousands of funerary monuments. These tombs, dolmens, and tower tombs appear simultaneously around the 4th millennium BC, even if we made an early date in Yemen for a dolmen in Hadramaut uh, with, uh, from the 1st millennium BC. This slide focuses on the Levant. In this area, especially in southern Syria, in the Leja, there are these two sets of tombs here, uh, dolmens and tower tombs, tend to overlap and as I already show in the case of the Akkar, we have some hybrid forms. On the left side uh, are some examples of dolmens in the Levant, in limestone or basaltic areas. And in the right side, the Akkar and around the Katina Lake close to Homs in Syria. For these dolmens, when one can observe several stages of conservation from a few scattered blocks uh, to an almost uh, intact here um, ar architecture covered by a dry stone uh, tumulus like here uh, that can give it uh, seen from the outside the appearance of a tower tomb. These pictures of the tower tombs from Jebel Guna uh, in Egypt to Jebel Afit in Oman show the homogeneity of this architecture. To return to the question uh, of where the megalithic uh, necropolis are located, look at this map inspired from a map published by Petraglia. The dotted lines represent communication routes in the Upper Paleo Paleolithic. During the Paleolithic, site distribution follows two main axes from the Horn of Africa through Babel Mendeb towards Southeast Anatolia and from Northern Africa towards Arabia and the Sinai. For the focus period concerned here, the end of the Neolithic and the Bronze Age from the end of the 5th millennium to the 3rd millennium BC, the sites remain the same as those of the Paleolithic. Their ramifications, however, are densified with secondary itineraries, which will later be used by caravans from South Arabia. And now, <clears throat> why megaliths in the Middle East? This is a question that is rarely asked. Often, megalithism is studied uh, as an accomplished fact, 
whereas the communities that built megalithic tombs had different funeral practices before this episode. What allowed, uh, what caused uh, these changes in funerary practices? What is the genesis of the megalithism in the Middle East? During the fifth millennium BC, men and women underwent important social changes, which are visible in their behavior towards their dead. From inhumation directly in the ground, they now choose funerary architectures above ground, whether in Arabia, but also in the Levant, in the Balkans, in, or in Europe, this quick mutation is fu uh, in funerary rituals, it's a true society phenomenon. Human group invest considerable time and resources to raise these monuments. Their builders respect various codes and despite the poor quality of some works, manage to obtain the expected result over a large geographical areas. The appearance of this stone architecture coincides with the emergence of, the, of Mesopotamian, Pharaonic and Levantine state societies uh, in the green uh, zones. Despite their deep imprint uh, in the Middle East landscape, these megalithic communities are ignored by researchers working on city-states. In their eyes, the areas at the periphery or in the margins of the alluvial plains of the Euphrat, Tiger and Nile are considered, uh, at best, a refuge areas. This vision is too narrow and doesn't give justice to the complex cultural phenomenon that we wish to start revising here. While the communities that people Middle East were few, they are still worth studying for two reasons. First, because they were implemented um, in areas that allowed them to control the circulation axes used from the upper Paleolithic onwards. Terrestrial uh, routes were punctuated by strategic points, the control of which conferred economic and political advantage to those that held them. Second, because these societies had access to rare and varied resources that city-state societies needed. These factors made the megalithic communities of the Levant and Arabia Peninsula vital trading partners for city-states. Despite of uh, our understanding of the emergence of these monuments being incomplete, is it clear that this transition was quick on both sides of the Middle East, from the Sinai to Oman and from Syria to Yemen? Not, not only uh, is the adoption of this funerary practice extremely rapid, but it also then endures for 2000 years, which is remarkable. Let me show you a few examples of what this megalithic tradition shows us about the communities. Here, the tower tombs grouped together at Jidran in Yemen. All the points, uh, the dots you are seeing on the picture are tower tombs, about 1,500. One this make for large gatherings, the ideal place for annual market. Behind the architectural uh, unified appearance of the megalithic tombs, architectural archaeology has shown that all tomb patrons did not invest equally in these monuments. Some tombs are more imposing than others, or better situated, conferring an important role to the topography of the landscape, as you can see uh, in the picture. This picture of a tower tomb is a center, uh, in the center whose dia uh, diameter is five meter, is surrounded by several dozen piles of stones whose forms the pendant. We don't know what is the function of these piles, but at first glance, they give a larger footprint to the burial chamber. Then in that picture, 
um, with at the top of the hill here, you have uh, the chamber of the two tombs followed by uh, the pendant. The footprint is the same for dolmens in the Levant. Some have pendant like the tower tombs, but they are also large enclosures. Um, here you have an example of uh, Karasa dolmens with a large enclosure. Uh, it's in South Syria. Uh, so we have um, regroupment, double chamber or several chamber um, uh, regrouped uh, in a common uh, enclosure. Even within a single platform, have been observed in both dolmen and tower tombs necropolises. These uh, new practices appear at the end of the megalithic period. The significance of these clusters probably has to do with family alliance or dependency systems. Another interesting phenomenon is the presence of numerous walls found within necropolises. At Karasa in Syria, their systematic registering brought to light the fact the necropolis was organized and structured through a parcel system. These walls were also observed in Jebel Mutawak in Jordan and are synonymous with a strong stru structuration of the funerary system. The disease therefore shaped the landscape. Uh, on the sketch here, all the black points are dolmen, and uh, here large enclosure, and even a funeral enclosure. And the, the red line are the, this wall who structure uh, the space. So to the question of what kind of lifestyle for these megalithic communities, climate studies on Middle East have shown a climatic degradation that gets uh, gets worse around 3400 BC. The populations that inhabited this territory must have faced climatic changes, but this did not result in them leaving the most arid areas. These communities adapted, overcame new constraints, and even took advantage in the new situation. The subsistence strategies adopted by Middle East communities are intrinsically uh, linked to the region they occupied. Located within desert or semi-desert uh, uh, areas, megalithic tombs have often been attributed to nomadic or semi-nomadic pastoral communities. Researchers did not envisage other ways of life in these areas. Alessandro de Maigret, an Italian archaeologist working in Yemen, was the first to propose the idea that these tower tomb necropolises in South Arabia are situated along commercial routes, linking the large city-state of South Arabian kingdoms. His chronological attribution of tower tombs to the South Arabian period is erroneous, but his vision of necropolises implemented as a strategic location and playing a role in a large communication network corresponds to a reality that is now well documented, thanks to prospections led in Arabia over the last 20 years. Even if traces of irrigation systems remain elusive, recent work from muller nerhoff a German archaeologist, demonstrate that the raised garden near Jawa in the Hara in Jordan were exploited while they were under the isoyet of 250 millimeters of yearly precipitations. Water and its management are determining factors in human settlements. Several articles mention a mastering of water systems thanks to well and rainwater collection system into natural or artificial systems, allowing these human communities to live in conditions that appear improbable to us today. It is also likely that more oases were present and offered favorable conditions to date productions, for example, date uh, palm. And 
agriculture and horticulture were indeed possible in these regions at the periphery of large river. Uh, it is also likely that the megalithic tombs building communities did not live solely for, uh, from agriculture or horticulture. As Alain Testar, a French anthropologist uh, wrote, not all societies aspire to sedentariness or fertile areas. Here, the collapsed uh, tower tombs from the Hara in Syria. Uh, Google Earth satellite images give us an idea of how the sites are distributed in this area. They are often placed on prominent um, uh, areas of the landscape with a long wall connecting them. Below them uh, are enclosure here or here, and small circular structures um, with our traces of campsites. Megalithic communities in this area, in Hara, had access to a large choice of resources that ensured good functioning and wealth production. Vestiges of this diverse functioning are visible in the thousands of traps, the famous kites, that bear witness to intensive hunting dated to the 7th millennium BC and still used in the 4th and 3rd millennium BC. Here on the slide, the interlocking uh, tower tombs here with uh, a pendant and the gazelle trap uh, have also been found um, um, and still in activity uh, when they built the tomb. Um, we have also smaller traps for selective uh, hunting, so, such as cheetah hunting, um, must have been essential uh, to acquire uh, hide, uh, furs, and meat. Large enclosure uh, or modified gazelle traps have also been found, perhaps to triage uh, animals. The intensification of pastoralism at the end of the fourth millennium BC allowed for capitalization uh, based on cattle and goat, offering an alternative to these societies that could not accumulate vegetal surpluses. Artisanal products such, such as uh, textiles made of food and diverse vegetal fiber uh, must have been an important activity. We have uh, also some examples of sedentary megalithic communities. Here we have the example of Sharaya in the southern Syria. Uh, is a famous village with 100 double hubs uh, houses. So here you have a picture from the top. Um, and this village uh, is protected by a uh, huge enclosure. And in the western part of the, of the village, uh, you have uh, two cemeteries of dolmens, like in the picture here. Same proximity um, between the dolmen and the double, double hubs houses in Jabal Mutawak in Jordan. Um, Juan Fernandez Trasgueras, uh, who, uh, who was uh, the first archaeologist uh, to excavate in this site, found also a sanctuary here uh, with a standing stone uh, and a collection of pottery with a snake decoration. This gave it the name of the snake uh, temple. Then uh, we have the tombs of Menges who are being studied um, in the north of Lebanon. Nearby uh, of this tomb here, there are uh, houses. So you can see uh, on the picture, the map. Uh, the, the house. It's not a real double ups uh, house, but sub rectangular houses. But we must have to excavate it this, uh, this year. So we will tell you more about the chronology after the excavation season in, in June. In the meantime, I have put on this slide uh, the objects discovered in the 60s by Father Maurice Talon. Uh, he was the first to have made excavations in the burial chambers of Menges. This uh, shows us um, the diversity of objects 
and materials to which the communities that built megalithic monuments had access. As a matter of fact, Middle East harbors several ecological niches where precious uh, minerals and other luxury goods can be acquired, like copper. We know that there is some um, first uh, exploitation in the Sinai uh, dated from the 4500 BC or in Jebel Afit in Oman too, as well as, as well as sulfur, asphalt, amber, lapis lazuli, flint, obsidian, cornelian. We know that there is uh, places in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Oman and Turkey. Um, we have also resources uh, such as the wood, it's why I put a picture of cedars in Lebanon, who were very um, uh, uh, appreciated in, in, the middle, uh, in the early Bronze Age. But we have also incense, mir coming from Yemen or Oman. Uh, we have medicinal plants, feathers, wax, ostrich eggs, turtle scales, shells and fine pearls coming from the desert, Indian Ocean, the Red Sea or the Persian Gulf. All these uh, artifacts uh, constitute uh, either exceptional products or necessary ingredients uh, that were probably very appreciated and fiercely uh, um, negotiated. All these resources were accessible within uh, the tribal system that ruled the Middle East. From the 4th millennium BC onwards, the periphery of margins of the alluvial plains were transformed into territories with a high market value. Serge Clezieux, a French archaeologist, was the first to describe this production economy as a dynamic reality in Arabia. Tribes represented in, in indispensable commercial partners for the acquisition of resources, alimentary networks, and rare products. Mesopotamian, Afro-Aaronic, and Levantine states were conception societies with huge material needs. As a result, the tribes of the Levant and Arabia, with their solid knowledge of the grounds and landscape, were able to provide food and exotic materials inaccessible to the city-states. A mutual be beneficial cohabitation was therefore established, transforming the, nomad, the nomadic tribes into efficient commercial operators. With a slow but constant accumulation of wealth, and thanks to exchange network operating from the inland of the coastline, within an area stretching from Egypt to Oman and from the Anatolian plateaus to the earth of Central Asia in Southern Turkmenistan, the Middle East megalithic communities grew along the city-states of which they became partners while preserving the control of their own economic growth. The relationship uh, between exchange network and the population of a given area implies a notion of control. Between the 5th and the 4th millennium BC, in order to trade the rare goods that their territory held, Levantine and Arabian tribes needed a network. They needed powerful commercial partners to link group to one another. For merchants, security with the trading territory is primordial. Access to water point, for example, must be ensured. The price of each merchandise should reflect the difficulty to acquire it, maybe by violence, perhaps of war. The economic logic of the merchant social class determines the mentality and practices of society and can even shape the elite. This was the case in Sumba and Nias in Indonesia, where tribal chiefs of the 17th and uh, on the 16th and 17th century oversaw communication with the European merchants. This wealth was used to build splendid megalithic tombs. But 
in the case of the megalithic tombs in the Middle East, uh, they are very ostentatious by both their form and, they, and their topographic uh, location. Their presence bore witness to the fact they, that their sponsors were able to create wealth and capitalize in, through symbolic construction. And I have two questions. Why abandon simple individual inhumations at the end of the Neolithic and during the, at the beginning of the Bronze Age? Why they invest considerable wealth into stone architecture dedicated to ancestors? Megalithic tombs do not have just a social function, an outlet for ostentatious behavior or as an economic regulator. Its cultural dimension is fundamental. Behavioral norms based on religion simplify tra transaction, augment predictability, lower transaction costs while augmenting competitivity and in the long term consolidate a form of power. Adopting a common identity also favored links between individuals to construct a network from which some can be excluded. It seems that the adhesion of communities to a codified architecture of megalithic tombs and to common beliefs linked to stone was linked to the growing wealth generated by commercial uh, exchanges. It can be envisaged as a symbolic expression understood by all beyond ethnic and regional belonging. This architecture constituted a common cultural foundation for a relatively homogeneous population, of which megalithic tombs is the most pronounced architectural manifestation. Consequently, the relationship of the megalithic tombs sponsors to the territory was probably, probably not a way to mark sedentariness, but rather a gestion uh, of the landscape, of access uh, to resources, and, the, and of the exchanges of uh, mer merchandises. Uh, this symbolic production is multifaceted and manifests itself in places of commemoration, funerary heart. So I will show you in few words other megalithic monuments, like the sanctuaries. These structures are usually larger than houses and surrounded uh, by bench seats. Raised stones are, are found in the middle. Uh, of such structures or integrated to the walls. Uh, so I show you uh, Jebel Mutawak here, and there is two similar examples were excavated um, in Yemen. The first was found in Al Rakla in the Roland in the 80s, and the second in Hawk. I had the chance to excavate it um, in 2005. And we can uh, <clears throat> attribute a radiocarbon date on bones, uh, place uh, its construction at the end of the fourth millennium uh, BC. Um, similar monuments were found in the Negev by Uzi Avner. A raised stone, uh, isolated or aligned, are numerous. Uh, no extensive research has unfortunately been conducted on this topic in the whole of Arabia and the Levant. Um, the link, um, the problem is the link, link between megalithic tombs and raised stones. Um, for now, um, it's unproven. Um, at Jebel Marad and Menjez, some isolated stones were found near tombs, uh, but uh, we uh, haven't uh, excavated them uh, until now. So uh, we hope to do it uh, for, for the case of uh, Menjez uh, this year too. We have uh, great alignments uh, um, 
in Rajajil in Saudi Arabia, um, here, but also in Yemen and uh, yes, here in Yemen and Jordan too. <clears throat> Something interesting also are the human representation. They were frequent during the PPNB, and uh, but it seemed to disappear during several millennia, and then reappear punctually at the end of the seventh uh, um, and the fifth millennium BC. The two pictures here uh, on the right uh, show the stella recently discovered by Wael Abu Azizé and Mohamed Raoune uh, in the Hara Desert in the Eastern Jordan. This stella has been dated to the seventh millennium BC and are part of a sanctuary. Let's pay attention to uh, one of the stella here, uh, which bears a trace of a stylized uh, gazelle trap on its face, a kind of hunting uh, cult. Then in the 60s, the archaeologist Diana Kirkbright excavated the site of Rixé, located at the Jordan-Saudi border in the Wadi Rum. The discovered vestiges are composed of a grid stone circle, 20 meter in diameter here, yeah, with over 200 statue meniers delimiting the perimeter. These representations of men and women were with schematic faces, clothes and daggers are exceptional in that they are dated to the end of the fifth millennium BC. Other many statues uh, discoveries have been made in the Hadramaut in Yemen, uh, here, but also in Syria, in Marat el Noman and Tel Brak, and there are slightly more recent chronology dated to the fourth and third millennium BC. Most were found isolated along circulation axes. In the Hadramaut in Yemen, all many statues are male. The common anam Anatomical motifs uh, include the nose, the brows, and the eyes in form of T-shaped. The mouth is missing, and the bottom of the face is underlined by a curved line and a beard. Small anthropomorphic statuettes are exceptional discoveries in the communal building or near settlement. They are attributed to the end of the fourth millennium BC. In contrast with many statues, these small statuettes are sculpted in the round. They, are, they all have the same position that uh, of a standing individual arms perpendicular to the body. The body is schematic, while the head and attributes are realistic. The dimensions of these uh, statuettes are relatively small. They fit in one hand and can be easily transported. Tombs are characterized by a rich iconography of engraved signs on the rock slabs with enigmatic signs such as line, circles, U, V, or triangles are found on corridor or exterior cladding. We have uh, the last uh, discoveries we did with Susanna uh, last uh, June, last year, sorry. Um, we are still uh, trying to understand uh, what kind of uh, uh, design uh, they are. Uh, recent discoveries also signal um, engravings in a megalithic context uh, on the cover of a dolmen in the Golan, here, yeah, with anthropom uh, anthropomorphic shapes. And in Akkar, uh, a lot of forms evocating uh, sometimes uh, snake uh, representation. Um, in the Akkar, in Menges, we have also three examples of snake representation. So uh, to summarize, uh, megalithic uh, practices appear diverse, varying from one region to the next. They nonetheless form a homogeneous uh, ensemble a shared megalithic culture in the Middle East. Uh, considering the multiple uh, facets of these practices, it only makes sense when considering the phenomenon in its globa uh, globality. 
from an uh, anthropological point of view, this global vision allows for some general characteristic uh, to emerge. The patrons of megaliths practiced a variety of modes of subsistence within arid environment and a diverse good exchange system. Megalithism can nonetheless be identified as a common uh, denominator of communities peopling this part of the world. The symbolic role of megalithic monuments is deep. It materializes a space and its transformation into territory. Its social role, meanwhile, is manifested in the physical difficulty of building such architectures, necessitating an organization in authority, displaying one's megalithic identity help net, uh, merchants to reinforce cooperation, reduce transaction cost, and to have proper access to resources and markets. The study of funerary architecture, the various uh, expression forms of um, megalithic structures with dolmen, tower tomb, sanctuary, stone alignment, many statue, anthropomorphic statue and carving, all offer us an opportunity to apprehend the thought process of the megalithic builders. So the next step, as Susanna uh, Vignonska evocated it at the beginning of the presentation, is the mega project, our baby. We are going to ask about many questions, but there is four important uh, questions. It's who are the first megalith uh, builders in Accra? What are the subsistence strategies and interaction with the landscape? How are their relation with the megalithic communities in the rest of the Middle East? Uh, did they play a role in the growth of city-states in the coastal plain or inland? We hope to come back to you next year with some answer of these uh, challenging questions. So in the meantime, uh, I am at your disposal to answer uh, to your question. And thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Tara, for this uh, really comprehensible and uh, uh, mind-blowing uh, conclusions about the mega megalithism. I've learned a lot from you too right now. And I'm opening a discussion. Uh, whoever would like to ask a questions, question, you are welcome. OK, so to, to warm up <laughs> the discussion, uh, I, um, despite our uh, multiple discussions so far, I'm still having these questions to you, especially with your uh, experience with the modern day megalithism. I was a funerary uh, cult or funerary ritual in the very center of the whole uh, megalithic uh, phenomenon in all the regions or you wouldn't say say this? Um, <clears throat> it in, in, in Indonesia, you have uh, a lot of place with, me with megalithism and this megalithism doesn't appear at the same time. We have uh, a sub-historic uh, megalithism around the 7th century to the 12th century and the new one who appears at the 7th uh, seven, uh, 17th, uh, 16th century until now. And um, it's easy to see that uh, they, uh, this megalithism uh, appear suddenly in this uh, uh, autoct uh, autochthon uh, uh, population when they have some contact with merchant uh, and the Buddhist merchant because they, they came to, to get some resources in the island uh, and uh, um, we, we saw that there is an increase of the, of the wealth and uh, it's exactly at that time that the megalithism appear. But it's, in fact, it's not, uh, I cannot compare to, to the Middle East because it's completely different. 
just the genesis of the of the megalithism in Indonesia is the contact between two different kind of society, uh, tribal tribal society and uh, state society. But uh, in I think in in Arabia it's totally different. It's uh, just the genesis of, me of the megalithism is um, is because they they need to control some areas. Okay, but uh, just, just to conclude, because there are some questions to you. Uh, uh, so it seems like uh, once, at least in case of Indonesia, once they uh, they, they uh, gained some extra resources, they were able to invest in their uh, funerary. Yeah, uh, exactly. Ritual. Yeah. So it seems yeah. to be some, like something really in the center. Yeah. Okay, I have two questions now. Hello, hello, Tara. Hello, Susan. hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, really uh, inspiring lecture. Um, I think uh, I can. It's it's a, as you say, it's a subject that is not uh, dealt with uh, by many or is not dwelt upon uh, by, uh, very often. So we we always discover something new. Um, I have many questions, but uh, the first one I would really like to um, tackle is uh, the question of chronology and how you connect uh, chronology, especially in the difference between uh, Northern Levant and Arabia. I don't know if I understood you correctly, but uh, you seem to suggest that uh, for at least for, for example, for tower tombs, um, or even for phenomena like uh, Risque for these uh, cultic um, stele um, with representations of uh, human representations, that they are a later phenomenon than in um, than Göbekli Tepe, let's say. And and also you suggest that, that megalithism in Arabia in the peninsula is something. I, I don't know if I understood you correctly. You, are you suggesting that this comes about because of the exchange or the um, or the exchange with um, with state communities in Egypt and Mesopotamia? Is this what you were suggesting, or did I not get the sequence? Yeah, right? the chronology between uh, Gobekli Tepe there is a few uh, millennia between the yeah the Gobekli Tepe and the tower tombs and the dolmen. The, just uh, at the beginning of the fourth millennium, uh, we, we can just observe with the remains of the tower tombs and the tombs and the dolmens, there is many thousands of monuments who, uh, um, who are visible in the landscape, don't need to, to excavate, it's just by survey we, we, we have uh, already uh, a lot of uh, of um, GIS uh, <laughs> and uh, multiple um, survey can 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 show that. Um, it's but what about the date? I mean, can you be yeah. sure that they? Yes, for for tower tombs uh, in Sinai, uh, there is uh, the excavation from the Israeli uh, uh, team in the in the eighties uh, who found a lot of material and they date uh, precisely the the, to the tower tombs. Um, the problem is uh, to be, uh, yes, the datation in the Levant um, and in the Middle East is always so enough, um, enough accurate. Uh, we are always uh, in between three uh, or 400 years, so it's difficult to say that they are contemporary. Mm. Uh, we can say that in the Sinai and in Yemen, for example, or in Saudi Arabia, because now they are very accurate dates, by uh, radiocarbon uh, on bones, uh, we have uh, we have similar datation. So we can say that the phenomenon appear uh, pra practically uh, simultaneously uh, between uh, east and west and north and south. So it's 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 sure. So you would and you would say the end of the fourth millennium for that. Yeah. Yeah. The first date we have for tower tombs it's four four thousand three hundred. Uh, but still uh, built tombs until the end of the third millennium and may, sometime may, mid mid second millennium. I think so. Some tower tombs in Saudi Arabia are from the 
the first millennium, they, they get they, some they're dates. reused, yes, yes. Yeah, they reuse them. But this is the phenomenon that you put in connection with Mesopotamia and Egypt? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that they are, they are, they are connecting to this. Uh, in fact, we are always, um, uh, we have to, of course, to find the, the proof. It's the, 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 the goal of the project we have with uh, Susanna. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of artifacts inside the tombs. And even uh, only the, the, to build the tombs, you need resources. You need people. You need uh, uh, money. If you, uh, it's, um, in all the ethno ethnographic uh, studies uh, I, I, I saw for megalithic, uh, megalithic tombs, you, you need enough resources to, to build them. And it's not poor people in the, in the nomadic uh, <laughs> land. <laughs> so we have to accept the idea that people were rich and they get some resource, uh, enough resource to build them. So how they can get these resources? Uh, so my hypothesis is the exchange with, uh, with the state societies because they, they grow in the same time. It's exactly the same period so I'm pretty sure that there is a connection. We cannot imagine that they are still in the valley, uh, stuck <laughs> alone uh, with no connection. Uh, and we have the proof of the artifact in the me megalithic tombs in Akkar. There, there is many things. There are seals, there, there is oxygen, there is flint, there is pottery and uh, cornelians. It's, it's really rich. It's not uh, as in the in maybe uh, in Mesopotamia, but uh, I think they, they, they have enough uh, enough wealth to uh, uh, yeah um, to to to, um, to um, kept the interest of the pe of people who are working in the in the alluvial plains. <laughs> in fact, I am so uh, sorry that uh, we cannot. Uh, communicate with uh, researchers who are working on the city-state and researchers who are working in the desertic areas. It's, I think we need to, um, to focus because there is connection. It's, uh, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm convinced. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, if I may add, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, exclude also uh, that this contact with the city state of that period was not that necessary. I think that the uh, megalithic societies, it's uh, such a large phenomenon that um, perhaps it was enough for them to communicate just between themselves and exchange the resources. The different groups had access to different resources. And why wouldn't be they just an yeah. uh, alternate model? Uh, just they I am, are sufficient. I am agree with that. But uh, if we take the, 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 the example of uh, Akkar, they are in, in a real communicate uh, a place uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, la trouée de homes uh, you you are going from the uh, the plains to the inland in in syria and they have to cross uh, this uh, this uh, this place so it's difficult to imagine that they are completely uh, excluded of this network in fact uh, okay maria you are waiting for your question <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the great lecture. Very interesting. I work in Africa, in the Sahara, and uh, we have the same kind of development for megalith yeah. architecture. So it starts in the northeastern Africa, in the eastern Sahara. We have uh, <clears throat> in the early Holocene also uh, megalithic architecture that is connected with communal uh, ritualism. Uh, so the, the same idea as yours. So then from the fifth millennium on, basically, you got uh, funerary uh, tombs, um, tumuli um, of clearly special people because they are not for everybody. They're clearly marking the landscape, as you said, so the same idea. And then from the eastern desert, they move east, uh, west into the Sahara. And through times, you know, uh, they also change the kind of architecture is getting very complex. So when you reach the western part of the Sahara, uh, there is also megalithism uh, on the Mediterranean uh, part of Africa, dolmens in particular. So yeah. I was actually 
quite um, curious about your dolmen because those dolmens in the um, uh, Mediterranean part of Africa more likely are not connected with the megalithism coming from the Sahara, mm -hmm. but the one coming from the, the Mediterranean, mm. where is also quite famous the dolmen uh, mm. um, architecture. So I was wondering how far into the space, so the um, dispersal of this kind of architecture in your, uh, let's say, in, in the Levant and also uh, northern part of uh, the Near East. So do, do you have that that kind of type of architecture anywhere else? Uh, what, dolmens? The dolmens, yeah. Yeah, for example, yeah, we, we have uh, the example of um, uh, dolmens in Bulgaria. They are very, they are later than, uh, than in uh, the Levant, for example. It's a comp it's a different uh, tradition, and uh, um, it's it's. Uh, I think it's. Um, sometimes you have niches like that, uh, who are not connecting to the other. Me, I'm doing this connection for the eleven because I have my experience of the field, and I can say that uh, tower tombs from Yemen are very similar of Oman or Sinai because I I saw them and I excavated them, so I, I can say that. Uh, there is connection, but of course uh, it seems that the dolmens in the North Africa are very uh, are later than uh, than those of the Levant. If I uh, we had some uh, we I heard a lecture with recent works, it may be Roman uh, Roman uh, period, huh? so uh, yeah, or first millennium before yeah, Christ, yeah, something. Yeah. Like that. So, yeah. but. And in the same time, we can say that uh, these dolmens in the North Africa are just recently studied. And uh, in fact, the, the, the first datation in the Levant was completely erroneous also. So I think we need to wait a little because it seems very strange that they are so late. <laughs> but why not? Huh? It's, 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 it's a case in, in Bulgaria, so it could be the same uh, uh, in that place. Um, I cannot speak for, for Africa, but it's really, I think the, your megalithism in North Africa, as the tombs in the Sahara are very interesting too. And they are earlier than in the Middle East, huh, because they, they appear in the fifth millennium. And for yeah. me, and you know, we have dolmens in, in, South, uh, in, in Yemen. They are uh, older than the, those in the Levant. Uh, they are from the fifth millennium. We have dates. So, yeah, why not? It could be. Uh, it's, uh, we are well, at the beginning of the of the study, and it's uh, it's it's open for yeah. <laughs> plenty of new uh, new discoveries. But in 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 Africa, as in in the Levant in, and Arabia, we have the same kind of development also from uh, the social political structure. So this kind of uh, groups were mobile pastoral oriented groups. They knew very well uh, the desert roads, so yeah. they were able to work and to trade, uh, to move, uh, and, and, and that's why they, they develop social complexity or political complexity, also but contemporary fact, to, to the Egypt, for instance. I developed my hypothesis of merchant because I found a, a very interesting example in the Sahara uh, from a, a researcher, but it's a contemporary story uh, with uh, um, Aisha Ahmed. Uh, she's working on jihadist, <laughs> jihadist uh, group, and she said that they, they in fact, uh, uh, a lot of tribes adopt uh, Islam just to to um, uh, to help for the for the merchant uh, merchant connection, and uh, <laughs> they they have a strong imprint in the in that field because uh, they they, they uh, can uh, protect all the people and uh, let us connect it and helps uh, the commercial uh, exchanges. And when I saw this idea in that place, I said, well, it could be a an interesting point of view for how uh, people in the fourth and uh, third millennium. It's, it's, it's just an idea I took from her. No, no, it's a, <laughs> we have actually two examples in in uh, in the Sahara. One in the Nile Valley in the fourth millennium, the development in Nubia 
yeah. of a complex polity contemporary with Egypt that is clearly connected with uh, mobile communities who knew how to, to deal with the desert roads. And, and the other one is the, the Garamantes of Central Sahara in the first millennium BC. They yeah. also with, with the Trans-Saharan trade was developed uh, in, in that yeah. way too. Yeah. So when you, you adopt one ideology, it could help to, yeah, to, to the spread of, the, of the, this ideology and the, the commercial exchange, in fact. It was the idea, in fact, behind uh, the, the study. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was really strange to connect the, the both, but uh, it, it's... Uh... Well, the environment is the same, so yeah. it, you know, adaptation to the environment can be similar and, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. You have similar trajectories. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. That uh, I think that this uh, bringing to get, together evidence from from uh, from southern Egypt and and other um, areas of Arabian Peninsula in a more or less contemporary periods might be really very interesting and and uh, and it's worth uh, continuing so maybe we will be maybe maybe we'll be able to to continue this uh, discussion um in, in some time not today i mean but <laughs> yeah it, it it's really worth uh, exploring i think uh, okay uh, I think uh, there is no no more questions that I can okay. see, uh, and we already uh, reached uh, an hour and a half. So yeah, uh, yeah but it it went uh, so quickly, <laughs> so passed by so quickly. Okay, so uh, thank you once more. Uh, thank you Tara. for all. Yeah, thank you for uh, all the participants also. <laughs> And yes, uh, I would like to invite all of you to our next meeting on 26th of April at uh, 2.30 p.m. And uh, this time uh, Piotr Kołodziejczyk from Jagiellonian University will be presenting his discovery, his most recent discoveries in, in Jordan. And then Maria Gatto on the 10th of May uh, will bring us to uh, to uh, Saharan region and her studies, her research in, in southern Egypt. Uh, these events, of course, will be announced and uh, you will be invited. So thank you once more, Tara, and see you. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you all. OK, thanks. Thanks a lot.